So timely folks in joining, we'll get started real soon. If you could type into the chat where you're tuning in from, Davi, we'd appreciate that so we know if you're in orange or not. And, and others, um, I see a few participants rolling in, but if you can type into the chat, the chat should only be visible to the host, myself and Dr. Katie Crawford Lackey. Uh, so others will not be seeing that information. I see a few more people joining. Nobody's typed in where they're coming, where they're zooming in from yet. Hopefully we'll get some of that. I think I can roll into this introduction since people are so much on time here. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Patrick Campbell, and I am here at the Center for the Constitution at James Madison's Montpelier. Thanks, uh, Becky, from tuning in from Lynchburg. Uh, the center is focused on the Constitution and its legacy. And our location at Montpelier is about a three minute walk from James Madison's home for 85 years. So we are really steeped in the importance of place. The ground we're on was a plantation. It was a site of enslavement for over 300 people. And James Madison was not only U.S. President, Secretary of State, a leading member of the House of Representatives. He is also rightfully known as the father of the Constitution, as the architect of the Bill of Rights. So we are really excited for this time to talk about a person, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, who can really help us understand our rights and help us understand our Constitution. I've um, got my wonderful colleague, I think you see her on the screen, Dr. Katie Crawford Lackey. She is a public historian. She specializes in place-based history. And Katie joined the Montpelier team almost two years ago now in 2021, bringing her expertise in civic engagement, museum management, and historic site interpretation. For five years before that, she had worked at the National Park Service in Washington, D.C., and during that time at the National Park Service, she wrote her dissertation about how the National Park Service, surface, I knew I could say that, interprets landscapes of protest, and specifically the Poor People's Campaign, which was the last protest Dr. King planned before his assassination. In April of 1968, uh, Katie, could you say hello and just give us a little bit of context about today's discussion? Sure, yeah. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be talking with you all this morning. Um, yeah, so I did a lot of my research on my dissertation about the Poor People's Campaign, the Civil Rights Movement, and how Washington, D.C. was really used as this platform for protest, um, which is a really important First Amendment right. And Today, we'll be talking broadly about the civil rights movement and King, but primarily how the focus of the movement really shifted, particularly in the late 1960s, and moving from this kind of mass protest to the Poor People's Campaign, which is reflective of this smaller demonstration, but with the goal of higher impact, higher visibility, because it's not a one day march, it's, a, it's an occupation protest. Um, and, and kind of the messaging, not just from the movement itself, but also from King. Um, so we'll be talking about place, particularly the National Mall and the movement's connection to that landscape. Katie, um, first in, in setting the scene for this, so I'm born in the 60s when, when Dr. Dr. King's assassinated, I, I don't think I have my first Stingray bike yet, um, but we've got images in the house. I'm seeing images in media. I'm seeing it as I go to kindergarten and first grade of uh, Dr. King. And, and, and what comes to my mind is these 
what we might say are iconic and these nonviolent protests. But, you know, help me broaden that understanding of, of Dr. King and his role in the civil rights movement. And, and maybe I should say civil rights struggle. Sure, and I think that's a really good starting point. And I'm gonna be sharing a PowerPoint with you all. Um, Patrick, let me know if you can see the, the screen. It's great. Okay. Um, and hit view there. Yep, we got it. So I think it's important to understand that the civil rights movement, I think a lot of folks have a general concept of what it was or what it achieved. Um, and in speaking for myself and, and my own secondary education and how I learned about it, I was taught that, you know, broad arc, it's a struggle, fortitude, you know, achieved success at the end of the day. Um, but many of us know that history, that life itself is a bit messier than that. Um, life is complicated. History is complex. And I think we tend to focus on the civil rights movement as this progress narrative of ultimately ending in success. The goals were achieved. But that, I think, deters us from digging a bit deeper and kind of interrogating the nuances of what remains to be accomplished still. And the civil rights movement is traditionally framed as either starting in 1954, 55, and ending with King's assassination in 1968. Um, but this is really a movement that's much broader. The struggle is much broader. Um, so there's always resistance to oppression and resilience in the face of it. Um, and that takes many different forms over the 1900s. And one of the kind of important key points I wanna point out is this 1941 proposed March on Washington. Um, and you'll see kind of this public call for the march on the screen. This is a call made by A. Philip Randolph, who's the president of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters Union. And he's basically putting a call out and saying, we need, you know, to end segregation in the military. We need to end discrimination in the defense industries. We need a march on Washington. And the president, uh, Franklin Roosevelt, is kind of um, very concerned. He knows the power of protest. So before uh, Randolph even has a chance to actually bring this group to Washington, to march on Washington, Roosevelt signs an executive order kind of addressing this issue. Um, so he signs executive order 8802, stating that will be no discrimination in the employment of workers in the defense industries. So mm -hmm. already in the 1940s, we're seeing that protesting has a lot of power in furthering civil rights. And Dr. King's, he's about 12 years old, right? So he, he's grown up in Atlanta seeing this. Exactly. Yeah, I think that's an important point to make because that's actually a point in his life when he's really grappling with um, he's really experiencing racial discrimination when he goes through school in his neighborhood. Um, and I'm sure that this was a really important moment for him um, in kind of defining his own career. And so this is this is a really important moment kind of before the traditional civil rights timeline that we tend to think of. But the key moments are the 1954 Brown v. Board case, which addressed the separate but equal doctrine. Um, in that case, uh, the Supreme Court uh, states that racial segregation in public schools is, is unconstitutional. So we can't have segregation in public schools. That is kind of one of the kickoff moments to the civil rights movement, as well as the 1955 Montgomery bus boycott. And that's where we see King really stepping into a leadership position. So for some context, you know, he has finished his studies, he's finished his PhD um, in theology. Uh, he is um, born and raised in Atlanta, Georgia, but he is going to a congregation um, in Alabama, uh, Montgomery, Alabama. And this bus boycott, uh, we know um, Rosa Parks, that's a name that's familiar to us. Uh, she um, takes a seat in the white section of the bus in Montgomery. And she serves as kind of this catalyst 
for challenging segregation in the transportation system in Montgomery, Alabama. And so a lot of these um, congregations in the city, including Kings, kind of rally and start organizing. Um, and they put together a plan for a what ends up being a 381 day bus boycott um, where people are not taking the bus because they want to desegregate it. And this leads to a Supreme Court case that desegregates the Montgomery transportation system. Um, so, so he's kind of, King is kind of getting his, um, his leadership role in this moment. And we see the Southern Christian Leadership Conference take form um, in 1957. And that's a, a civil rights group that King is a key organizer in that. Um, so was Baird Rustin, who was another really key civil rights figure, Ella Baker. And they put together um, a bunch of these congregations, Black churches, and this group, this organization, um, the main goal is to challenge segregation and transportation all across the South. So they want to do what they did in Montgomery, but on a larger scale. Um, okay. And so we see Kate, him. Um, mm -hmm. When you say he's leading this, I think he's about 26 years old when this boycott happens. And does he already have his own church at this point also? Yes. Yeah, he has his own church. Um, and, and, and now he's he, he's mid-20s and he's already stepping into this leadership role. Wow. Sorry, sorry to stop you there. Oh, no. But it, it is really impressive. He's very young when he takes on this role. And um, one of the reasons there was kind of, I, I guess, you would say maybe a leadership vacuum, but a lot of uh, folks from the older generation were looking for younger people to lead. And he was kind of, a, you know, at this place, at this church, he's been thinking about these really deep ideas and he's kind of um, in this position to lead. Um, and we see him be the first president of the SCLC, the Southern um, uh, Leadership Conference. Right. And so, we're, we're getting towards, a, a lot of us know, March on Washington, 1963. Now he's in his, um, you know, early 30s. How does Dr. King elevate himself to one of these leading voices? And, or maybe also, how does his tone change from, you know, the 26-year-old who's becoming a leader um, with the bus boycotts through this 13 years later when he's assassinated um, tragically. But, so how does he, I don't know if I can use the word evolve, Katie, or, or how, how does his approach or tone change? Hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. And I think it's important to note that King, as well as the SCLC, were very much committed to nonviolence. That's kind of how that coalition formed. So that was always a real inherent part of kind of his, his vision, his doctrine, as well as the broader movement. Um, but we, in, in kind of studying his life, we can see that he does make connections between race and class early on, but we don't necessarily see that reflected as much in his rhetoric and his speeches until the mid to late 60s. Um, so the focus, as we see with the SCLC, you know, there, there's a lot of different civil rights organizations kind of operating across the country at this point in time. Um, the SCLC, as I mentioned, is really focused on desegregating transportation in the South. That's kind of their goal. And we see this all coming together in part with the 1963 March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, where we've got major figures at a lot of these different civil rights organizations coming together to plan this larger March on Washington. And much of the movement's the strategy um, lie in the idea that not only is nonviolent, you know, protest important, but you know, we are respectable, deserving citizens in society. We are entitled to these rights and the end goal being, we would like to see legislation protecting our rights as American citizens. So 
we kind of see that in his early rhetoric, but then as we go into the mid to late 60s, we start to see King articulate calls for economic reform, um, even as early as 1964, but we see and hear a bit more about his vision by 65, 66, 67. Um, and he's broadening from just black civil rights to kind of all human rights. Um, and I wanna just point out the difference between the two. Um, so one of the ways to describe these rights is human rights are rights that everyone has because they're human. And civil rights, on the other hand, are rights that people have because they're citizens. Um, and in the US, the framework of the relationship between a citizen and the government is established by the constitution. So he's kind of broadening what he wants to achieve and the group he wants to achieve it for. And the Poor People's Campaign, which is a protest that he plans um, and that is carried out in spring of 1968 is a really good example, um, a, a tangible example of what he's talking about. Um, and the idea for the Poor People's Campaign was to work with regional SCLC groups and other constituents to bring people to Washington, DC, to basically demand an economic bill of rights. They were championing um, the need for greater economic security, not just for black Americans, for native Americans, um, you know, for poor white Americans, for um, Latino Americans. So this becomes a movement to, again, what King is already thinking about race and class, identify poverty as a cru crucial, barrier to economic success and civic participation. So let me drill down a little bit there. And um, our audience, again, you can put your uh, comments in the chat. Only Katie and I will see them. But you give us a lot of rights. And I, I want to get to place again. Mm -hmm. um, you talked about economic rights and human rights and civil rights uh, and regional groups. When you said regional groups, it makes me wonder, you know, I think of Dr. King in Washington or Rosa Parks in Montgomery, Alabama. How does place play into this movement and struggle and, and how is it important um, either to the civil rights movement or to the poor people's campaign? Mm. Place and, and space and landscape are very important to the movement in two different ways, I would say. So there's how landscape was used and leveraged to achieve the goals of the civil rights movement, but also that access to land itself was one of the end goals. Um, so I touched on briefly that A. Philip Randolph, for example, um, you know, he is an early civil rights leader. He's recognizing the power of having a physical presence um, through protest, particularly in Washington, DC. The idea of marching on Washington, the nation's capital, that's a concept that develops in the early 1900s um, due to, I would say, two key groups, American veterans and women suffragists. Um, these are kind of the two groups that start to pioneer what protesting or marching on Washington looks like. Um, and again, we see you know, early civil rights leaders understanding the power of protest, particularly in this place, in the nation's capital, um, because it's, it's visibility. It has kind of almost a special symbolic significance because it's the seat of our federal government. Um, so in you know, the late 1950s, early 1960s, um, the main civil rights leaders are trying to plan protests that correspond with this power of place. Um, and the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, which you see here, which took place in August of 63, is one such example. And this march is organized by um, what we refer to as the Big Six. So the heads of the main civil rights organizations at the time. And uh, this is a photograph of some of those key players. Um, and you'll see names up there that you recognize. Um, King is seated here. We've got A. Philip Randolph here. Um, John Lewis is up here. So these are the faces of the kind of primary civil rights leaders at the time. Um, they're getting together to plan this march. Um, it's 
it really begins as kind of a, um, a labor march. They want um, job opportunities for Black Americans. And this march is one of the largest in American history. Um, there's about rough estimate of about 250,000 participants, um, folks who participate in this march. And I know we often associate it with King and his I Have a Dream speech um, that he gave on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. Um, but there's also, again, these faces in the photograph here who were big leaders as well. And to your question about place, it's interesting because you know, obviously the Lincoln Memorial is a very important place, I would say to all Americans, it's a, it's a memorial. But it's also inscribed with a marker where King stood when he gave this speech during this march. Um, so his presence there is literally inscribed into that landscape. Um, now, I would say the idea for the Poor People's Campaign, though, is a bit different than this march, obviously, as I mentioned. The Poor People's Campaign, um, which 1968, is not about bringing hundreds of thousands of people to Washington. It's about- right. You, you got to help me understand this, Katie, because um, I, I know Dr. King was a reverend and a minister, and, and he knows about confessionals. So, so my confession is I, I had not heard of the Poor People's Campaign until this week. I apologize. Um, so when I think of Dr. King and I think of the civil rights movement, mm -hmm. why is it so important to understand the Poor People's Campaign? Right. Well, it's a different kind of protest. It's an occupation protest that's intended to, again, not have hundreds of thousands of people. It's about showing the face of poverty. And that is a campaign he plans, not just obviously coordinating with the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, but with Chicano activists, uh, Native American civil rights groups, um, poor white Americans, particularly groups from um, the Appalachian region. Um, these groups he wants to march on Washington and, and basically occupy it. Have, they set up a city on the National Mall, um, which I'll go to, into a bit more in a, in a minute, but the goal Kind of in this later protest is not numbers it's visibility um seeing the face of poverty in america and i think one of the powerful pieces of the poor people's campaign that we don't really talk a lot about is this committee of 100 that is sent to washington dc to lobby in the weeks before the campaign and that's that's a critical piece so it's not just about the protest itself it's about people, average citizens being able to come to their government, um, their you know, elected representatives with their concerns. Um, so this committee of 100 in the planning for the Poor People's Campaign, this group goes to Washington DC and meets with you know, the head of the Department of Labor, the head of the Department of Justice. They're bringing their concerns to their um, officials. And I think one of the most impactful meetings that this group has um, in, in April and early May of 1968, literally just a week before the campaign begins, they meet with the Department of Interior, um, specifically the secretary, um, Secretary Udall. And this group lays out their, their goals for the campaign and what they wanna see. And one of the big things they express, and when I say they, I mean people like Reverend Abernathy, um, people like Mel Tome, who is the director of the Native Indian Youth Council. I'm talking about Corky Gonzalez, who is a leader and organizer of the Chicano movement. They're all in the room talking to the secretary. Martin Luther King is absent because he has been assassinated earlier that month. But they're carrying on this message for him, and they tell the secretary the Department of Interior is directly responsible for the poverty of many Americans because of the seizure of Native American lands, because of the seizure of parts of Mexico. Um, and I'll ha I have to say, in doing the research um, for my dissertation, reading the transcript from that meeting was one of the most powerful moments I had, because you can, you read the words that these people were saying, these average citizens, um, and I, I want to read a little bit of it. 
um, because this group is talking about how they, um, a lot of Black Americans, for example, were not able to access national parks, one, because of discrimination, but two, because of a lack of funds to travel to these parks and participate. Um, and the um, Corky Gonzalez actually says to the secretary that a lot of poor Americans are often forced to, quote, give away and sell their land away in order to gain some support for their children and themselves, end quote. And he then goes on to say that America was being, quote, turned into the playground for the affluent, end quote. So this is a group of Native Americans, Latino Americans, Black Americans, you know, folks from Appalachia saying we need access to spaces of recreation. You know, we are being forced to sell away our land. Um, we, you know, our land was taken from us and we were assimilated. So that's kind of the point I was making earlier about, it's not just about leveraging land for protest. It's also saying, hey, land and access to it and ownership of it plays a key part of why there's this economic disparity in America, which is a key part of the civil rights movement. One of our guests wrote in how class might unite us and, and economic justice. And when you talked about Dr. King bringing in Native Americans, uh, Chicanos, other groups. Uh, I wrote down not numbers, but visibility. Uh, and I can't help but um, think about James Madison, the guy with the kind of softer voice, maybe five foot two, 105, 110 pounds. And, and we have his legacy today. Um, you're telling me the Poor People's Campaign uh, is one of Dr. King's visions, but it, it really launches after he's assassinated. Is there a legacy today that we can tie in the 2020s to the, this 1960s campaign that Dr. King starts? Sure, yeah, I think that's very important to think about because, and I'll give you some context here. Um, this is a kind of Google Maps view, aerial view of the National Mall. Um, we talked about obviously the Lincoln Memorial, that's where this 1963 uh, march took place. But the Poor People's Campaign, if you visit the National Mall today, you won't find a marker, you won't find a monument, you won't find even a simple interpretive sign about that campaign, despite its importance. And I've indicated on this map, in that red circle, that's where the Poor People's Campaign took place from May to June of 1968. Now, yes, King was assassinated in April and of that year, and he spent kind of the late 67, early 68 planning with Reverend Afranathy this campaign. Now, with his assassination, um, a lot of kind of the, the plans were put on hold, but Abernathy really steps in for King and brings the vision to fruition. And so these groups come to Washington, D.C. after securing a permit with the National Park Service because you need a permit to protest. And they essentially set up what, which is, it's, it's a basically a city on the National Mall. I mean, it even has its own zip code. They lay down telephone wires, they put up tents, um, There's they put in plumbing on the National Mall. I mean, it is its own city. And it's located right kind of where the Korean War Memorial is today and the DC World War I Memorial, if you're familiar with the National Mall. Right. And to give you a sense of what it looked like, here is kind of an aerial vision, of, of aerial view of what it looked like at the time. So it's essentially tents set up and there's um, some great, the National Archives has some really incredible maps which show exactly how this little city on the mall was organized. So you had different coalitions that set up kind of their side of the camp um, in this strip. And there was everything from, you know, a medical tent, um, the Poor People's Campaign had their own kind of law enforcement marshals um, to kind of keep order in the city. Um, there was free health clinics. So the idea was that this city would stay there until the government addressed these calls for, you know, this economic bill of rights. Now, if anybody has done research on the Poor People's Campaign, um, 
you'll know, I'll just skip forward real quick. It was a terrible summer with lots and lots of rain. So there was a lot of issues in terms of making this city on the mall visible. Um, it was just kind of muddy all the time and kind of miserable for those people who were participating. Um, so it did end in June of 1968 without any kind of um, tangible legislation. So for example, the March on Washington in 63, um, a lot of historians cite the 1964 um, Civil Rights Act as a basically an outcome of that march. We don't really see kind of the same thing happen with the Poor People's Campaign. There's no legislation that really addresses this. Um, but to your point about what is the legacy of this, this campaign sparks other movements. This campaign is really the start of a lot of these organizations working together. Um, and this is something I found in a lot of the documents that I reviewed at the National Archives is that there's a there's this assumption that Native American groups aren't working with Black civil rights groups, that aren't working with Latino groups. And that's not true. There's a lot of collaboration and a lot of the groundwork that's laid with this campaign um, kind of furthers these later movements of kind of the women's liberation movement, of the Chicano movement, of the American Indian movement. Right. Uh, we don't have any questions in the chat. We do have one observation of a uh, guest saying they recall it being called Resurrection City. Uh, I do get to interview Dr. Katie Crawford Lackey again on Sunday. Um, not the same uh, topic exactly. It's going to be about Dr. King, but we're going to talk more about civic participation on Sunday, and that'll be on site. That will not be a virtual program. I'm looking to see if any questions come up in the chat. Um, Katie, anything you want to say? To, to wrap us up before I tell our guests what's going on this weekend? Yeah, I think um, kind of in tying back to this theme of place. So, you know, we've, we've talked a little bit about um, the civil rights movement broadly and what it looked like, the kind of King's role within it. And then this campaign and how, even though maybe it was towards the tail end of the civil rights movement, um, it's still very much an important piece in, in moving forward. Um, but how we think about these places is also important. So again, the 63 March on Washington, King's participation and leadership is literally now part of the Lincoln Memorial. Why do we remember that moment, that speech he gave versus this protest here? Um, and we have that you know, beautiful um, memorial to King on the Tidal Basin. So if I go back to the map, um, I, I just think it's fascinating because we have King inscribed in the Lincoln Memorial now. We have the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial on the Tidal Basin. And yet kind of this key culminating protest, his kind of final legacy that's in this area in red has no type of interpretation whatsoever. Um, and I think it's it's not necessarily a question, it's a lofty question to answer that I can't answer on this call, but I think it's important for everybody to consider why do we commemorate or remember certain spaces over others? Um, why is there specific meaning attached with the places? What places perhaps are we overlooking? Um, and what are the layers to these places? And I think there's a lot of that here at Montpelier in particular. We have a lot of different stories, a lot of different landscapes, and there's many, many layers of untold stories here. And it's, you know, what is the landscape holding that we just need to discover? Um, so next time you're in Washington, D.C. and you're walking on the mall, I would encourage you to walk by the, the Washington, D.C. World War I Memorial and kind of be in that space and think about this campaign, this protest that happened there. Um, so, so that would be my my parting thought is is to encourage people to kind of think about place and space in that way. Well, our audience just got a lot more excited in the last five minutes as you were talking. Uh, one of them, maybe the simplest question, Katie, and, and I'm going to try to get to the others, is 
I think you mentioned there's not even a marker there. So possibly there's not a plan. And one of the guests said, um, how would we lobby Department of Interior or National Park, Park Service for such a marker? Is, yes. is there a means? There is. And you know, this space is National Park Service, so Department of Interior. And it would really depend on what kind of interpretation um, you know, we're talking about. So to do a memorial, like a large scale memorial, would be, I mean, it would be huge. It would take Congress to get involved. If we're talking about more interpretation, something like a marker, something like a program, that's something that the National Park Service could better address. And the Park Service is broken up into different regions. So the National Capital Region kind of oversees the National Mall, and they have a Department for Interpretation where rangers will do programs on the mall. And I do know for the 50th anniversary of the Poor People's Campaign, they did have a program on the mall, but it was kind of a single day event. So if we wanted a more permanent kind of designation for this space, that would take the National Capital Region um, probably doing um, some assessment plans. And as far as I know at the moment, actually, there is um, plans to put kind of an outpost of the, the park police um, within this, this red circle here. So there's, I would say, plans to kind of perhaps enhance this, this area, but not to commemorate it to the Poor People's Campaign. And I think, and I'll say to that, I think interpretation comes when we as a society um, are kind of ready to mm -hmm. hear this history, unfortunately. Um, it takes broad acceptance um, and agreement that we want to hear and read about this history. And I'm not quite sure if we are there yet because this is still a very much understudied and under discussed aspect of the civil rights movement. Katie, I'm going to try to throw two things at you at once, both media and Dr. Barber, when you talk about are we, are we ready for this history? So a um, uh, guest asked about the role of media in elevating the awareness. I, I don't know if you're able to at all contrast the 1960s role uh, versus um, 2023. Uh, I don't know if I almost might take a shot at that. Um, uh, but also bringing out, you, you talk about the stories we don't tell. Um, the, not only the stories we don't tell about Dr. King, but the stories we don't tell about the others around him, like Dr. Barber. You want to take on um, either media or Dr. Barber in this discussion? Yes, absolutely. The media is very key, not just to the civil rights protests, but to others as well. Um, earlier on, I mentioned that um, veterans were one of the early groups that actually kind of pioneered this idea of marching on Washington. And in 1932, um, World War I veterans, um, the Bonus Armies, planned a, a protest um, very similar to the Poor People's Campaign. Actually, King kind of modeled the Poor People's Campaign on this 1932 um, veterans occupation of DC. And they had their own kind of encampment in 32, um, located in what is now Anacostia Park. Um, they created their own newspaper because they knew that in order for, you know, the, the government to address their issues, there had to be broad public support. So I think that's really powerful in knowing that these veterans knew how powerful media was, that they actually established their own temporary newspaper. Now, for the Poor People's Campaign, very similar lines of thinking, um, Resurrection City was just for occupants themselves. So it's not like members of the public could kind of walk in and out as they wanted, or you know, park police could just walk in and out as they wanted. It was kind of its own defined area. But organizers welcomed in journalists because they wanted this story to be documented and told. So that was very, very key, um, getting the message out. Um, and we see that in a lot of other campaigns as well, um, this need for broad public support in order to be successful. And then, oh, sorry, go ahead, Patrick. No, you go ahead. 
I was well, I, I love to hear your thoughts on the media too. Um, I think it's there's so much more to it. So I, I welcome your perspective. We know the media then was so much more uh, monolithic in a way or homogenous. Um, I mean, when I'm growing up in the 70s, it doesn't matter a whole lot if I watch ABC or CBS or NBC. You're really getting the same stories. You're often getting the same lead. Um, the, the diversity of media can have its difficulties in terms of dividing the nation or dividing the, the people and citizens, the residents of this nation. Um, but it, it does expose so many more things that the homogenous 60s media didn't. And, and so um, we have this beauty as a, as a boomer, I, I get a little bit worried that we get so siloed and, 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 and get divided. So I'm looking for ways to get around that. Um, Dr. Katie Crawford Lackey, this has been so much fun. I am even more excited about our Sunday discussion now. Um, we, we've got a busy weekend here at Montpelier, folks. We are reopening at James Madison's Montpelier after what is our annual two-week closure where we kind of try to uh, spruce things up. There's some things about that on the website. We've got hourly tours this weekend, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. Uh, we're not open as much on the weekend, on uh, in the winter, I should say. So pre-purchase is a great idea for six tours a day. We've got three specialty tours this weekend. So Constitution Tour on Saturday and Monday at 1130. That tour does go in the house like the highlights tours. Um, and we have two tours outside. So um, there's going to be some sun. Bring your hat and gloves. Uh, warm coat. Uh, and Slave Community Tour goes every day this weekend at 1.30, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. And I'll be leading a Bill of Rights tour outside in the crisp January air, just like the Enslaved Community Tour. But the Bill of Rights is 12.30 on Sunday. Uh, these are all on our website as well as our 3 p.m. in person um, with Dr. Katie Crawford Lackey. And we're really focusing on, on how Dr. King um, impacts the Constitution, right? We're, we're at the Center for the Constitution here at Madison's Lifelong Home, and, and how he impacts our Constitution and helps us think about our civic participation or encourages us to change our civic participation. So please come see us, help us as we try to encounter history, uh, as we learn about the enslaved Americans that made the father of the Constitution possible, and just the enduring legacy of James Madison and the United States Constitution. Thank you so much for being here. We look forward to seeing you this weekend. Bye-bye.